Medical opinion swings back and forth on many things, but I would argue that few things have been in that category as much as coffee. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of You and Me and Multiple Sclerosis. My name is Pam, and I've been living with multiple sclerosis for 38 and a half years, and I've been happily researching all different aspects of living with multiple sclerosis so that I can have the best quality of life possible, despite the fact that I think I'm going to be living with MS to my last breath. Today, I want to talk about something that I dearly love, and I'm sure many of you do as well, and that is coffee. Now, over the years, and long before I really knew that my MS was going to play a role in my life, I had heard first the medical community say, coffee was bad for you, coffee was good for you, coffee has antioxidants, coffee affects your blood pressure, on and on and on, back and forth. And, you know, the state of things in research is no different today than the popular press had it all over the last few decades. Let's go ahead, though, and just take a look at oh, just a couple of these papers and articles, just so we get some idea of the broad range of opinions about coffee. Well, here's an article from 2020 called The Effect of Coffee and Caffeine Consumption on Patients with Multiple Sclerosis-Related Fatigue. It's quite a tongue twister in itself, just getting through the title. But at any rate, let's just take a look at the abstract for this article to see what they have to say. Just judging from the title, it's a little vague on whether they're going to be positive or negative about coffee, so let's find out. They say here that coffee and caffeine are considered to have beneficial effects in patients with multiple sclerosis, an autoimmune disease of the central nervous system that can lead to disability and chronic fatigue. In the present study, the preference in terms of coffee and caffeine consumption in patients with multiple sclerosis was assessed. In total, the opinions of 124 MS patients were explored with a questionnaire which was developed to investigate the consumption behavior and associated beneficial and harmful effects of coffee and caffeine concerning symptoms of fatigue. And the results are that our study showed that 37.1% of the included patients experienced severe symptoms of fatigue. In our cohort, fatigue was not related to age, type of diagnosis or duration of the disease. The effects of coffee did not differ between MS patients with and without fatigue. Very few side effects linked to coffee consumption were reported, and we could demonstrate that coffee consumption had no negative impact on quality of sleep. A positive effect on everyday life was observed, particularly among patients with a mid-level expanded disability status scale or EDSS. The strongest effects of coffee consumption were observed regarding a better ability to concentrate while fulfilling tasks, an expanded attention span, and a better structured daily routine. And our conclusions are that since coffee showed no severe side effects, and in the absence of an effective fatigue therapy, coffee consumption might be a therapeutic approach for selected patients with MS-related fatigue. Okay, well, there you go. They did research. I'm sure somebody funded them to do this. But what were the conclusions? Certainly nothing groundbreaking. It sounds like what they're saying is, if you like coffee, drink coffee. It might help your fatigue, and it's certainly not going to do you any harm. So I guess that's sort of a, a positive in its own way, but it doesn't really give us any new knowledge. We don't know anything better than we knew before. Here's a paper that's a little bit more recent. This one came out in February of 2022, so a little more than a, well, about a year and a half ago. The Impact of Lifetime Coffee and Tea Loads on Multiple Sclerosis Severity. So this isn't looking at fatigue. This is looking at the extent of our disability. And just looking at affiliation of the lead author, 
He's with the University of Eastern Piedmont in Italy. And again, let's just look at the abstract. The background and aims of this study. The association between lifestyle factors and multiple sclerosis disease severity and progression has been investigated to a lesser extent compared with susceptibility to the disease. We aimed to assess the impact of lifetime coffee and tea consumption on MS severity. And our methods were, to, we designed a cross-sectional study of 208 patients, 139 females and 69 males. That's actually a good ratio since the prevalence of MS in the population is basically 2 to 1 females to males. Consecutively recruited at the Department of Neurology in Novara, Italy, and they were asked about their lifetime consumption of coffee and tea. So right off the bat, we're relying on patient recollection and honesty. That isn't exactly scientific, I suppose, but I don't know how else they could get the data at this point. The lifetime intensity of consumption, cups per day, was estimated as the weighted sum of the mean number of standard cups drunk per day at different ages. A measure of cumulative lifetime load of the exposure was expressed in terms of cup years. There's a good one. That's a new term. I like it. Cup years. Disease severity was estimated by the multiple sclerosis severity score. I think that must be related to EDSS. And then we'll skip down here. Results. The severity score was not associated with the status of coffee or tea consumer or the amount of cups per day or cup years. The odds ratio for falling in the upper tertile of the MS severity score distribution was 1.30, 95% confidence intervals, etc., etc., etc. Lots of numbers in here. Let's skip down. Heavy consumers of coffee, however, four to eight cups a day, more frequently had a progressive form than small consumers, one to three cups a day, and non-consumers, 19% versus 14% versus 0%, and had a significantly higher age at MS onset. Now that's very interesting because, you know, how are we saying that coffee causes MS or prevents MS? If you don't drink coffee, you won't get MS? Is that what we're saying? See, this is the relationship here to me is kind of murky at this point. I'm not sure what they're saying. But hopefully their conclusions will make that more clear. But they go on to say here that although not reaching statistical significance, coffee consumers positive for HLA A02 had a six-fold risk of being in the worst tertile compared to never consumers, whereas the risk was only 1.3 for coffee consumers negative for the same allele. Okay, so I think what they must be saying is coffee can actually be bad for you. And as they say in the conclusions, coffee or tea intake is not associated with different severity of MS. However, we cannot exclude a possible effect of higher doses of coffee for the subgroup of progressive patients. So in other words, they're not going to postulate that anything is causal here but they're just noticing a correlation, and correlation is not causality. I don't know why someone with progressive MS would drink more coffee, but that's all got to be looked into a little bit better, especially when, as I said earlier, they're relying on the study participants to be both honest and to have a good and reliable memory of how much coffee they used to drink all the way through their lives. Hmm, very interesting indeed. Well, this site is from Overcoming MS, and George Jelinek, who created the Overcoming MS Diet and Program, is himself something of an expert on MS, I would have to say. So let's see what he has to say about caffeine and MS. He says, research has shown coffee to have an anti-inflammatory effect, and I have heard that, and to reduce the likelihood of developing MS. Okay, I'm not sure I've heard that, but it is unclear why this is. The neuroprotective properties of caffeine mean it can suppress inflammation and also assist with symptoms such as fatigue, when used correctly, constipation, and cognitive fog. 
That would seem intuitively obvious because even people without MS use coffee for similar reasons. High doses can worsen certain symptoms, and there is mixed advice around the benefits, but a moderate amount of coffee should not be detrimental to patients with MS. So there you go. There's the long and the short of what he has to say on the subject. And now we'll look at an article on WebMD. Can coffee prevent MS? Well, I'm here to tell you right now, it can't. I've had coffee in my life for, oh, I don't know, since I was a little girl. My grandma used to mix it with milk. Hardly any coffee, though. There was mostly milk. Never fear. So I could sit with her and mom when they would gossip together at the kitchen table. And I hear I have MS. So I don't think that just drinking coffee is going to prevent MS. But of course, this article was published back in 2017, and I am so sure that the medical information that we have gained since then is a lot more reliable, wouldn't you say? If you can't tell, I'm being facetious. Okay, so here they clarify it a little bit. You may have heard that drinking coffee can prevent MS. That is not exactly true. You can't count on your morning latte to prevent MS. Drinking a lot of coffee may improve your odds, though. Okay. This says that one study looked at more than 2,300 people enrolled in a health plan in Northern California, and it found that people who drank the most coffee had much lower odds of getting MS. A Swedish study came up with similar results. But don't fill up that giant mug just yet, though. Okay, so, well, yeah, I'm curious as I'm looking at this. Again, we need to understand the mechanism of why that would even be. Why would coffee have a good or a bad effect? We want to know, what's the mechanism? Well, skipping down here to a section on how could it help, WebMD folks say that MS causes your body's immune system to attack the protective layers around nerves in your brain and spine, the central nervous system. The caffeine stimulates through your central nervous system, and it can also ease inflammation of tissue there and help you keep these protective layers. Incidentally, caffeine is associated with lower odds of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's diseases also, so why not MS? I, I don't know, I, is that compelling? So anti-inflammatories would help you with your MS, and I suppose that that's been talked a lot about in terms of supplements or various types of food, you need to keep your inflammation levels low to keep your MS under control. Caffeine in particular, I'm not sure yet I'm seeing the actual mechanism. We're not talking about that, are we? And it says, how much would you need to drink? Those California researchers asked folks how many cups of caffeinated coffee they had each day, once again relying on honesty and good memory. The study found a significant drop in the chances of having MS with those who said they drank four or more cups. That's quite a lot of coffee, actually. In the Swedish study, people who drank three to six cups had a lower chance of getting MS than non-coffee drinkers, while the Swedes who downed seven or more cups of coffee lowered their odds the most. Now, I'm kind of trying to compare this with what we heard earlier, that people with progressive MS drink more coffee. So, you tell me. I don't know. See? This is why any kind of nutrient or food or any environmental factor is open to continuous debate. I don't think we ever really get to the bottom of it. As they say here in the fine print, it clearly opens the road to start new studies in this. And there's a scientist at Johns Hopkins University, Elias Sotirchos. And Sortirchos noted that coffee has more than 1,000 biologically active compounds, so it's possible that one of these, not the caffeine, produced the results in the Swedish and California studies. Consumption of soda and tea in the two studies did not change the odds for MS, he said, so it may not be the caffeine. And I, I've heard this other places, that we are looking at the caffeine when there's actually so many compounds in coffee that might be responsible for either the good or the bad health effects that it has. So, of course, researchers need more study to figure out whether caffeine helps lower rates of MS in people who downed a lot of coffee. And if it does, researchers still need to learn how it helps. Yes, once again, we need to know the mechanism.
Well, I think the best thing to do is go out to clinicaltrials.gov and see what's currently being studied in terms of coffee and multiple sclerosis. So let's go ahead and search. I've already filled this out. We're going to search multiple sclerosis and coffee consumption. And we're going to do the search. And look at that. No results. No records found. <laughs> so apparently, there, this is not a hot topic of research right now. There's an awful lot of anecdotal evidence, and there's an awful lot of uh, what various nutritionists will weigh in on based on their knowledge of how coffee works in the body, but there's nothing really going on mo at the moment to help us understand whether coffee is good for us, bad for us, or makes no difference at all. So, I don't know what to conclude from this, except that I guess we're left on our own recognizance, which we often are, aren't we? So it looks like we're going to have to look at research done about the benefits or detriments of coffee independent of multiple sclerosis. And I found this paper from the National Library of Medicine, and it was published in December of 2020 also. It's on Neuroprotective Effects of Coffee Bioactive Compounds, a review. And the affiliations of the authors, as I've got here, are both out of Poland, the Department of Animal Physiology and Pharmacology, and also the Laboratory of Preclinical Testing at uh, the Medical University of Lublin in Poland. So here's the abstract real quick. We'll see what they say. Coffee is one of the most widely consumed beverages worldwide. It is usually identified as a stimulant because of a high content of caffeine. We already knew that. However, caffeine is not the only coffee bioactive component. The coffee beverage is, in fact, a mixture of a number of bioactive compounds such as polyphenols, especially chlorogenic acids in green beans and caffeic acid in roasted coffee beans, alkaloids, caffeine and trigonoline, and the diterpenes, cafestol and caweol, Extended, extensive research shows that coffee consumption appears to have beneficial effects on human health. Regular coffee intake may protect from many chronic disorders, including cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, obesity, and some types of cancer. Importantly, coffee consumption seems to be also correlated with a decreased risk of developing some neurodegenerative conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and dementia. Regular coffee intake may also reduce the risk of stroke. The mechanism underlying these effects is, however, still poorly understood. Oh, well. I, I was getting excited, but oh, well. This review summarizes the current knowledge on the neuroprotective potential of the main bioactive coffee components, i.e. caffeine, chlorogenic acid, caffeic acid, trigonoline, caweol, and cafestol. Data from both in vitro and in vivo, so both in test tubes and in people, or at least in living creatures, preclinical experiments, including potential therapeutic applications, are reviewed and discussed. Epidemiological studies and clinical reports on the matter are also described. Moreover, potential molecular mechanisms by which coffee bioactive components may provide neuroprotection are reviewed. And here are some other papers that cover the same sorts of things, and I will put these links in below. But it's kind of looking like while they're, they're seeing the beneficial effects from some components of coffee, they still are not very clear on exactly how that works. So I will keep looking for this, though. And in the meantime, stay tuned. Well, okay, just as I said, there's no consensus of opinion that sticks around for more than a few years when it comes to coffee. I don't know about you, but I don't intend to give it up. <laughs> I like my morning coffee. 
I have limited it to where I don't drink it after noon because I don't want it to affect my sleep, but I still like to start my day after I've had my glass of water. I still like to top, to top off the, my tank with a couple of cups of coffee. Let me know in the comments if you're in that boat too, or if you're one of the folks who don't drink coffee at all. Many in my family don't even touch the stuff, and others seem like they can't run without it. So I know that coffee is one of those love-hate things. Where do you fall in all that? Let me know in the comments. But that's all I have for you today. So until my next video, take really good care of yourself, and I'll see you again. Thank you.